starting now. Hi, uh, welcome everybody to uh, our fifth se season of our climate crisis and climate uh, biodiversity crisis session on the Collective for Climate Action. Uh, I am with uh, Sarah Lundin, uh, who will be doing an introduction on the Climate Ecological Emergency Alliance and the Bill, uh, and also joined by Dr. Charlie Gardner as well. So thank you so much for coming. I'm just gonna pass just shortly to Ian, and um, to give us a bit of a kind of admin about our question and answer session. So Ian, if you'd like to give us a bit of an overview of where you can find things and the presentations. Yeah, you all should have had an email um, that's come through and um, that will give you access to the slider where you can add your questions. They, they can be anonymous or you can add your name. So um, there's no need to worry about what you, what you ask. Um, and um, there's also links to the slides that should be in the email that you received beforehand. But if I did make a mistake and they're not, um, you can find them in the show notes of this um, live stream. So they should be available to you if you, um, if you want to see those too. Um, that's, uh, there'll be Q&A after the talk. Um, Charlie, um, Charlie's going to talk for, for, for a while and, and so Sarah. Um, and then we'll have that question and answer session afterwards, okay? So over to you, Heather. Okay, well, Sarah, thank you so much. And it'll be great to learn more about the Alliance and the Bill. Thanks very much. Uh, so I, I guess there's a number of things for me to cover. I'm going to do uh, an outline of the Alliance, uh, the strategy that we're adopting, and I will cover what is in the bill. And uh, Dr. Charlie Gardner is then going to take over and talk a bit more in depth around the link between uh, the ecological crisis we're facing and the climate crisis. So the... Um, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill has been drafted by uh, a number of actors. Um, it includes activists, it includes academics, scientists, and it also includes uh, people from the uh, democracy world, deliberative democracy world. And what we've done is we've looked at the situation that we face, <clears throat> we've looked at the science, We've taken advice from the scientists and we've drafted what we believe is a proposal uh, to address the, the, the very, very precarious situation that we're in at the moment. Uh, so the current plan the government's working towards gives us a 50-50 chance, if everyone across the world does it, at keeping temperatures at or below 1.5 degrees. And it does that if negative emission technologies come on board at a massive scale that do not yet exist. The bill takes a very different approach. The bill says what we need to do is to reduce our, uh, en reduce our carbon emissions at source. And we have to do that in line with the IPCC's 60-60, 66 percent chance of keeping temperature rise at or below 1.5 degrees. And we can't do that relying on technologies that don't yet exist. So uh, we're following the IPCC reports, we're following the science, but we're saying we have to plan for the world as it is and not take a huge gamble on what might happen. And the bill also links in, it also recognises uh, that the Earth systems cannot be separated and we cannot address the climate and ecological emergency at the expense of our ecology and our other earth systems. And, and we're facing two major crises. So we're in the start of a mass uh, extinction event, the sixth mass extinction event, uh, which we also, uh, we need those ecological systems to be in place for us to live and live well. So we cannot address the climate at the expense of ecology. We cannot address ecology at the expense of the climate. We have to bring both of those together and we have to address them both at once. They are not separate policy areas, which is the way that governments have previously addressed them. And to do this, as uh, Kevin Anderson says, there are no non-radical uh, paths left to us. We, we need to take radical action now. And radical action, to, for governments to take radical action, you need to take the citizens with you. And we've seen this around COVID. Uh, the citizens of the United Country, the citizens across the globe actually, have mainly recognised 
that radical action was needed by their governments to address a viral pandemic. And we have accepted extreme measures that limited our personal freedoms. And mostly we have done this willingly, that we've not had to enforce that uh, necessarily. Uh, um, well, well, we haven't. We, we've pretty much done it. The police have been on the streets, but pretty much people have done that because governments have asked them to do it. And the radical actions that are going to be required uh, to, to address the twin emergencies also need the citizens' consent to do that. And one way of doing that, of addressing really tricky, difficult questions, is via deliberative democracies, where you take a representational section of your citizens of the country and you explain the issues to them and the science to them, and you ask them uh, to define the solutions or the policy areas which need to be addressed. And governments can then take that away and then use that uh, to determine uh, the legislative framework. And in doing that, you have the backing of the citizens for the actions that you take. So the bill is really in three parts. It's linking the climate and the ecology, and then it's also looking at the democratic process and the way that we achieve uh, the mandate for governments to act. So how are we going to get the bill passed? Well, that, ha, handily, that's also in, in, in three different parts. Um, so the alliance has been set up. It's uh, Although some of the people within the alliance were part of Extinction Rebellion, they, we are actually actually a separate organisation, uh, we have recognised that what we need to do is to actually go to Westminster, go to um, local governments and the, the other national parliaments and actually use the legislative framework to pursue our aims. And, and that is what we're doing. Uh, many other people come on board. Uh, we're, we're not a massive group. We're quite small. We're staffed mostly by volunteers number of people come on board uh, from business, from academia. And the plan is we are lobbying at Westminster. We are also lobbying around um, allies. So uh, we're taking the bill to various organizations and asking them to support it. And you can see on our website, we've got quite a wide range of people and organizations now supporting the bill. So for example, we've got Tim Ibel, who's the head of engineering down in Bath. We've got the Co-op Bank. We've got um, Isabella Tree from the NEP Estates. Uh, we've got the Co-op Bank. You know, there's all sorts of various people who are coming on board. For uh, we've got a Sterling Prize architect. Uh, they've they've come on board. So it's a huge range of allies who are saying, "Oh, like we need to address this. You know, we need to address these things together." And they've come in behind us. Greenpeace and Oxfam are also supporting the bill. So for a wide range of civic societies and from academia have come on board and are supporting the bill. And that gives us gravitas. And also um, when we go and talk to MPs or talk to councils, we have the backing of these various civic groups. Uh, we're lobbying at Westminster. We've got 108 MPs who's, who in the last parliament uh, signed up to publicly support the bill and give it their backing. And then also at grassroots, we've got a grassroots uh, activist hub. I'm not sure that's the right word. Uh, we've got grassroots activists who set up different groups across the country. They're lobbying their MPs, their constituency MPs. And they're also talking to their local councils and asking their local councils to pass motions supporting the bill and writing to the, uh, to the MPs the, whose constituency they're in, asking them to support the bill. Uh, and we've got over 60 councils now supporting the bill, 25 of which are principal authorities, uh, including uh, Oxfordshire and Devon County Council. So we are beginning to get some quite large uh, local authorities coming in behind the bill. We will look at the, uh, the mayors as well, the, the mayoral, uh, the, there's 11 now, I think, metro mayors. Uh, so we'll actually uh, be seeking to get them to to come in behind the bill as well. So we're operating at all those different levels and I think we're probably one of the few sort of Westminster lobbying groups that also has that grassroots campaign behind it. Um, one of the pushbacks about the bill we do get is that, well, it's just a presentation bill and it's not going to go anywhere. It won't become law. It's just a campaigning tool. 
And actually it's worth remembering here that the 2008 Climate Change Act started its life in 2005 as a presentation bill. And that piece of legislation, which I think in many ways the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is an upgrade uh, and an extension of the Climate Change Act, um, received almost unanimous support in Parliament uh, when it was voted on. I think only three MPs voted against it. or It, it might even have just, be, have just been one. So it became a real point of unity at Westminster. And that's really where we need to be again. So this is not an opposition bill. We really see it as a cross-party bill to get cross-party support. And because if we're going to address the crises we face, and, and let's face it, the last time we were at 418 parts per million of carbon dioxide, which is where we are now, human beings did not exist. Uh, temperatures were three to four degrees warmer and sea levels were 16 metres higher. So, uh, you know, we really are in, in a really, really precarious situation and we need that unity of support. And that's why we're going to local authorities and all of those other people to say, look, this is not just us. This is civil society. This is your citizens that want this protection. And I think I'll stop there. No, that, that's brilliant. I think that's sometimes what we need is that kind of understanding where we are now and seeing kind of the reality. I think that was quite key for me. The word was, you know, um, you know, what reality we are in now and dealing with it in a way that we can do. So I, I really appreciate the kind of open and, and candor of that as well. So it's really, really useful. Um, and I know, um, Dr. Gardner, you, you have got a lot of ties in with the ecology side of things. So I, I thought I'd let you have this time just to kind of give an overview of the, the work you've been doing with the CE Alliance. Thanks very much, Heather. Um, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm having a bit of trouble with my Zoom at the minute, and I'm trying to um, change laptops, but it's going to take me a couple of minutes. I wonder if you could perhaps take a question for Sarah, and yeah. while, whilst I do that, would that be okay? Absolutely fine. No, we've got quite a few questions coming through, so yeah, we'll we'll go ahead with with that part. So, so Sarah. Um, so this, as I mentioned, there are, are a few questions that we've seen. So I'm just going to pick a couple out. So I know that you mentioned about, you know, campaigning, going through um, kind of uh, the bill element in terms of different MPs. And there's one on here where they've people have talked to their um, and wrote a letter to their MP, um, but they're not getting much progress on it. Are there any kind of tips or anywhere that they can kind of have more uh, momentum, really? Okay, so there is, um, uh, especially from the Conservatives, there is pretty much a standard response, uh, which is being um, uh, put back if you write and ask your Conservative MP to support the bill. Um, on the website, we actually have a hub, a campaigner's hub, and there's a whole list of uh, assets there that you can go and look at and will help you to move the conversation forward with, with your MP. I think it's worth um, to keep writing to the MP, to pick up on the, uh, the, the response you get, to pick up on those points and push back against them. So keep that correspondence going, get as many other people in the constituency to write as possible so that you're not on your own doing this. Um, when uh, Dr. Rebecca Wills uh, looked at why the climate was not being acted on at Westminster, one of the main issues that came back was that MPs were saying they were not getting contacted by their constituents uh, about the climate and ecological crisis. So the more contact you make with them, even though it feels like you're hitting a brick wall, uh, the more likely it is for, for that wall to crack. And remember, the walls always look solid until they burst. Yeah, so, so keeping going like that is, is really, really important. Um, finding those businesses and organisations within your constituency that your MP likes and supports and getting them to back the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is also another way of doing it. So, for example, WIs. Really, really influential. Who knew, right? The WI is such an influential organisation. When the MPs start getting letters from the WI saying, will you back this bit of legislation? They sit up and take note. Uh, 
church groups, faith groups, um, any big employers, private employers, people like that. You can pull all of those people in and get them to write to your MP. So, or any membership organisation you're part of, the local wildlife trust, the hedgehog trust, all, all of those things, get them to write to your, to, to your MP. So it's not just you, you've, you've got some backup behind you. No, I love that. And I know that on your website as well, you've got a list of organisations that have partnered as well. So you can go and find that. And I think that's a really good idea. Sometimes you feel a little alone sometimes doing it. So the more, and I like the pushing of the, the floodgates as well. So um, another one that's come through, I know that a lot of, as you said, academia has helped in terms of doing the bill. There's been a question about are government organisations involved in the work at all? Or has it been very much how it kind of was created? Uh, so, um, well, <laughs> to be totally honest, like when we set ourselves up, nobody really wanted to come and talk to us because like, who were we? So it's, it's not like we were a Greenpeace or Oxfam where we could go and knock on ministers' doors and they'd come and talk to us. Uh, so no, government organisations were not really involved in the drafting of this bill, other than, you know, people in universities yeah. like Charlie for example so so you know we have used what's open to us we have used people who are supporters who work within government we have had conversations with people in government and you know and tried to work out you know where those points of pressure are that we need to be pushing on but ultimately the bill has pretty much been drafted as a response to what is needed as opposed to what is poli considered politically achievable so it's, a, it's coming from a very different point of view it's not coming from that point of well what what can we do what can we achieve within this political environment we're saying well actually physics is physics and chemistry is chemistry and we have to address the science the, the science and find the solutions to the scientific problem and so that's what we've tried to do and that's what we've tried to put into the political realm Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm probably going to pass to uh, Charlie now. I think he's all ready. Um, and thank you for your patience as well. Thanks, Heather. And yeah, th thanks, everyone. And sorry about that. So I do have a, um, a small presentation for you. It'll probably take me. Um, a, oh, sorry. Um, Heather, could you possibly enable um, participant screen sharing, please? That's been disabled, or whoever's. Or I think it might be Ian. <laughs> yep, happening right. Should be okay now. Brilliant. So, um, what I'd like to sp speak to you about really is to um, go a bit further with some of the points that Sarah made. Um, about the connections between the climate and ecological emergencies. I'd like to make the case that really we cannot either address or survive the climate crisis without conserving the natural world. And we cannot conserve the natural world without getting a handle on the climate crisis. Um, therefore, we absolutely need synergistic legislation that addresses the two and specifically um, aims to maximize the opportunities that we get from addressing the two simultaneously and minimize the risks of addressing them separately. So we face an emergency. Um, a thousand scientists have signed a paper saying that we are in an emergency and they they chose this word very carefully because an emergency requires us to change what we are doing. It needs us to stop, to evaluate what we've been doing so far, which hasn't been working, and to concentrate all our efforts on the urgent task at hand. Um, we hear a lot about the climate emergency. We're heading for... Um, probably four degrees of temperature rise uh, by the end of this century. Already we have hit 1.1 degree of blood pre-industrial temperatures. And this is starting to have devastating, absolutely devastating impacts across the planet. And here are just a few of them from last year. So in 2020, we had the hottest day ever recorded on planet Earth. 
uh, 54 degrees in California. It reached 38 degrees in Arctic Siberia last June. It was as hot in the Arctic as it has ever been in the UK. We've seen extraordinary wildfires across North and South America, Russia, I think there were 20 million hectares burnt in Russia last year. Um, of course, Australia very famously. There were 4 million people displaced in a single flooding event in China last year. Another 4 million people displaced by floods in India and Nepal. There was the busiest ever Atlantic hurricane season. They had to move on to the Greek alphabet because they ran out of letters to say to name the storms. And we had the strongest storm ever recorded on planet Earth, which Typhoon Goni, which hit the Philippines. This had sustained wind speeds of over 200 miles an hour, not gusts, but sustained wind speeds. So this is where we are already at 1.1 degrees. We're heading for four degrees. It's, you know, the organized human society is not going to be possible at four degrees. That means people alive today have a very, very high chance of seeing the collapse of civilization within their lifetimes. And of course, we're not talking about hypothetical young people. We're talking about my nephews and, and your children. As well as this climate emergency, we face an ecological emergency. We are destroying the natural world at quite a pace and it is not slowing down. So we're seeing the com continued destruction and degradation of, of forests and wetlands and other habitats. We're seeing the continued over harvesting of species through industrial fishing and the bushmeat trade and illegal wildlife trade. We see the disruption to the ecosystem caused by um, the loss of these species um, because every species is connected to other species. So they have knock on impacts. Excuse some of the technical um, terminology here. We have problems with invasive species that, which cost um, you, you, you know, tens of billions um, just in this country every year. We have huge and growing problems of pollution, not just plastic and chemical pollution, but the systematic poisoning of our agricultural landscapes with pesticides and herbicides. And then, of course, we have climate change um, and its equally evil twin ocean acidification, um, which I won't go into here. Um, these these issues are causing huge declines in the extent of our ecosystems, but also the diversity and the quality of our ecosystems. We're seeing declines in the richness and the diversity and the abundance of species. We're seeing declines in the genetic diversity of the world. We're seeing declines in the ecosystem services. So that means the benefits that humanity gets from nature. We're seeing declines in the resilience of ecosystems, how well they're able to resist what we're throwing at them. We're seeing the declines in the resilience of human societies and you know, the COVID pandemic is a wonderful example of that. And we're seeing declines in the resilience of our planetary system, which um, climate change is of course the great example of that. So we're not just in a climate emergency, we are also in an ecological emergency. We have these two very serious, um, and very urgent emergencies. But the thing is, they heavily feed into each other. They are two sides of the same coin. Because we cannot conserve the natural world without addressing climate change, but we also cannot address climate change or survive it without conserving the natural world. Um, and that's what I want to focus on first. So nature is key to our hopes of surviving climate change because we need, um, we need natural ecosystems to absorb and sequester carbon, in other words, to mitigate climate change, to minimize how bad it gets. But we also need ecosystems to help us survive the climate breakdown that will happen regardless, to help us adapt to its impacts. So we know that ecosystems are hugely important for storing carbon. About a quarter of all our greenhouse gas emissions are absorbed in terrestrial ecosystems, and about a quarter are absorbed in the oceans. We tend to think of tropical forests when we think of these, uh, what we call carbon sinks, but actually all kinds of ecosystems absorb carbon. From wetlands, 
grasslands, some mangroves, and in this country, um, fins and peat bogs and, and mires. In fact, the top six inches of a British peat bog can store as much carbon as the, an equivalent area of um, tropical rainforest. The thing is, we, we tend to think of um, these carbon stores as just being about the soil and the vegetation. So in other words, if we stop the trees getting cut down, if we stop this habitat getting destroyed, then we will be able to preserve all the carbon. But actually it's much more complex than that because these ecosystems are more than trees. They also include the animals that live in them because they play critical functional roles. And one, there are two key groups of animals. One is fruit eating animals, frugivores, because they disperse seeds. And it turns out that trees that have seeds that are dispersed by animals tend to be a lot bigger and a lot more carbon dense than trees whose seeds are dispersed by the wind. I mean, this has real implications for, for, for climate change because there are many tropical forests around the world, which we call empty forests. You look at the satellite imagery and it looks like there's a forest there, but actually all the animals are gone. They've been hunted out um, or for other reasons, they've disappeared. And this means that all the big carbon rich trees aren't able to reproduce. So the carbon storage in those forests can decline by as much as 28%, even without a single tree being cut. So we need to do more than stop trees being cut. We need to save the animal communities that live in them too. Another great example is predators, because predators control herbivores. There's a reason why every tree that's ever been planted in the UK has to be surrounded by a plastic tube, and that's because we don't have the animals at the top of the food chain, the predators, which would control the populations of deer. Many of you, I'm sure, might have seen a, a wonderful George Monbiot video that talks about what happened in Yellowstone National Park when wolves were brought back. Suddenly, lots of trees started growing again because the deer populations was being controlled. There's another wonderful example with sea otters in, in the Pacific Ocean. When, when the fur trade was at its height in the 19th century, the sea otters nearly went extinct. And what happened was that sea urchin populations went mad. Nothing was eating the sea urchin, so there were just huge amounts of them. And they grazed all the seaweed. The, the, the kelp forests, this wonderful underwater habitat, disappeared because they were grazed by the urchins. And that meant that had big impacts for commercial fisheries because there was nowhere for the fish to grow and it had big impacts for climate change because all this carbon that was stored was gone. So we need to conserve predators, we need to conserve fruit eating animals. One other kind of animal that we need to conserve, whales. Whales fertilize phytoplankton with their excrement. It's full of these rare trace minerals which the phytoplankton need to, to grow and phytoplankton um, store a huge amount of carbon, as much as the whole Amazon rainforest. It has been estimated that if we could restore the populations of great whales to the populations they were at before we started industrial whaling, then that alone would sequester 4% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Huge. So we need nature to absorb carbon and to stop climate change being really terrible. It's, it's the cheapest and most effective thing we can do right now other than stopping burning fossil fuels. But we also need nature to adapt to the climate impacts that are definitely going to happen anyway. So we suffer huge problems with flooding in this country. A large reason for that is because we've deforested the uplands. Forests act as a sponge, help the water filter down into um, into the soil. If we want to stop flooding in this country, grow forests, reintroduce beavers. Simple as that. We also know that mangroves and salt marshes and coral reefs are great at um, protecting coastlines from, from storms and things like that. We will need genetic diversity to survive climate breakdown. So the wild relatives of our crops contain genetic diversity that will be important in helping us develop new strains of crops to um, overcome climate challenges. Similarly, we will face 
emerging diseases, diseases we're not even aware of yet as climate change hits. Well, most of our drugs come from you know, biodiversity. So we'll need this genetic diversity. Um, it's also the case that in many places around the world, people depend on biodiversity um, as a safety net. You know, if a farmer in this country loses her crops, then she has crop insurance and the government provides um, you know, a, a welfare state that will provide a safety net. In Madagascar, where I lived for a long time, and many other tropical uh, low-income countries, governments don't provide this safety net. So if your crops fail, you have to go to the forest to find something to eat or something you can sell. And this is um, an increasing issue. So nature stops us from suffering the worst impacts of climate change. Um, so we've seen how we can't survive climate change without nature, but nature can't survive um, without us addressing climate change because climate change is the biggest threat to nature. This animation shows the expansion and contraction of ice sheets across Northern Europe from 37,000 years ago to 8,000 years ago. And of course, it's very easy to imagine that as these ice sheets have expanded and contracted, so all the plants and animals must have shifted where they lived in response to that. You know, Scotland was covered in a huge ice sheet until 13,000 years ago. So every plant and animal that we see in Scotland now has moved there since. So, so the natural world is, is very capable of responding to climate change, and it always has done in the past. The difference is that when climate change happened in the past, species were responding in an intact world. The world is not intact anymore. We have destroyed it. So that means patches of natural habitat are highly fragmented. Species just can't keep up. But so species are responding to climate change by shifting where they are in space like that. They're also shifting in time, changing the seasonality of their events. Many of you will have noticed that spring is very late this year because it's, it's been really cold. You know, the oak leaves, as I look out my window, they're, they're two weeks delayed from, from where they normally are. This is the opposite of the recent pattern, which is that spring is coming earlier and earlier and earlier. And this is a problem because species um, are all responding at different rates. And of course, they're all connected with other species. So for example, the, the gray tits and blue tits in my garden, they are suffering, their population is declining because the caterpillars they feed on in the springtime, the caterpillars of, of the winter moth, they're emerging much, much earlier and the birds just can't breed early enough. They can't keep up. So by the time their chicks have hatched, all the caterpillars are finished. And so they're not breeding so successfully. There are other examples with plants and pollinators. So, for example, this orchid is, is, the, um, is, is a bee orchid. It's emerging at a different time to its pollinator, the buffish mining bee, so they're not getting pollinated. So ecosystems are breaking down. Um, and because of the way the species are, are, are responding. But there are also some ecosystems which are particularly suffering because of um, biophysical changes to, to, to where they live because of climate change. The, the, the great example of that, of course, is sea ice, polar sea ice, which is going to be gone very, very soon. No more polar bears, no more walruses, no more penguins. We're also seeing more and more the, the vulnerability of tropical forests to drying and fire. Um, and coral reefs are another highly, highly vulnerable ecosystem. At high ocean temperatures, they, they bleach and they die. So we are in a situation where by uh, towards the end of this century, there will be no more polar, polar sea ice, no more tropical forests, no more uh, coral reefs. That is how serious the impacts of climate change are for the natural world. But of course, that's just the direct impact of climate change on the natural world. There is also the indirect impacts, and that's how humans respond, how our societies react in the face of these emergency uh, you know, climate impacts. Um, and our um, the way we choose to mitigate 
climate change can have major impacts on the natural world. One of the most popular climate actions is tree planting. This is hugely popular amongst the public. It's hugely popular amongst um, politicians because it seems cheap and easy and it's certainly much simpler than um, stopping burning fossil fuels, which is what is ultimately needed. But when people talk about tree planting, what they generally mean is establishing industrial plantations of um, you know, spruce and pine that many of you will be familiar with if you visited Scotland or Wales. These places are not forests. They are deserts for wildlife. They are of no use at all. Even worse, if you plant such a plantation on a fen, then you've actually destroyed wildlife because the fen had wildlife in the first place, which you've destroyed by planting on it. So these things are terrible. What, what we're seeing increasingly is that tree planting policies can actually have um, huge unforeseen consequences that, that have the opposite impact of what they were attending for. So here's a newspaper headline on the left here from uh, two months ago in Bloomberg about a tree planting program in Mexico, which encouraged deforestation. So the Mexican government gave money for planting trees. They didn't give money for conserving trees that were already there. Of course, people didn't want to plant trees on their farmland. That was where they grew food. So the only place they could plant trees is where there was forest. To earn the money, they had to first cut down the forest to create space to plant trees. This tree planting program had huge perverse outcomes. It led to deforestation. On the bottom right here, we see a map showing areas that have been prioritized as global forest restoration or global tree planting opportunities in orange. But the places in purple are places which are not forested ecosystem. These are grasslands. So, um, and of course it would be nonsensical to talk about planting up the Masai Mara or the Serengeti under eucalyptus plantations, but these are the sorts of things that are being proposed in the name of climate change. Renewable infrastructure is a huge issue to a couple um, of, of headlines here from the LA Times. Um, solar, solar farm operators trying to remove um, protections for desert biodiversity because they want to put solar farms in the deserts. We have you know, one of the biggest threats in Amazonia is not deforestation, it's hydroelectric dams for hydro and electricity generation, which floods huge areas of forest. And then perhaps the biggest concern um, in terms of, of our transition to, to zero carbon is bioenergy. Um, we know that like biofuels such as oil palm trigger tropical deforestation, so we absolutely should not be growing plants to feed our vehicles, um, we should be yeah, growing plants to feed humanity. But an emerging issue is wood energy. So the top left here is Drax Power Station in North Yorkshire. This is the largest power station in the UK. I think it supplies 6% of, of our um, electricity. And it's recently um, converted from burning coal to burning biomass wood pellets in the name of climate change. But the thing is, it burns more wood than is produced in the whole of the UK. So it, it actually gets its wood from um, old growth forests in the Baltic and in North America. On the bottom left here is a picture of um, old growth swamp forests in South Carolina that are being cut to create pellets to burn in power stations in the UK. It is it's absolutely nonsensical that we should be cutting biodiverse species rich forests to burn for electricity. It is doubly nonsensical that we should be doing so in the name of decarbonization. This is an absolute nonsense, but this is the sort of impact that adopting emergency climate policies will have on the natural world if we don't have safeguards in place, if we don't ensure that our climate policies don't negatively impact biodiversity. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip this, this, that last point there. Um, one of our mitigation actions, there is also our adaptation, how we adapt to climate change. 
This map shows um, the, shi the shifting suitability of um, the land for growing wine grapes. The areas in red are places where we can currently grow grapes, but won't be able to by 2050. The areas in blue are places where we cannot grow grapes currently, but will be able to by 2050 under a high emissions scenario. So I'm just showing you this as an illustration of the extent to which climate change is just going to completely change everything about how our landscapes are managed. Many of our landscapes that are currently managed for nature now, we don't conserve them because we love nature. We just conserve them because they're no good for anything else. They don't, they're not economically valuable for farming. So uh, yeah, we'll let nature have it. Well, what happens if climate change means that these places do become economically valuable for farming because new crops can grow there? Yeah, big issues we need to think about. I talked about safety nets. Um, you know, in, in, in Madagascar, farmers are increasingly abandoning farming because yeah, they can't farm anymore. The, the, the rainy season is just not predictable enough anymore. So they, you know, they have four options. Either they go to the forest to start producing charcoal. They can move up into the hills to do shifting cultivation, slash and burn agriculture. They can move to the oceans to become fisher people, or they can move to the cities um, to look for work there. So of their four options faced with the impacts of climate change, three of those options depend on biodiversity. Three of them depend on nature as a safety net when they lose their preferred livelihoods. This is happening now all over the world. We talk about climate change having an impact on future generations in this country. Well, around the rest of the world, it's having an impact on current generations. People are dying, people are suffering now. Um, one last example of how humanity is going to adapt to climate change. This map, you know, I showed a, a, a map earlier showing which places are suitable for growing grapes. This is an equivalent map showing which places are suitable for humanity. It turns out that places with a mean annual temperature above 29 degrees cannot support humanity. People just cannot live in places that hot. Currently, those places are limited to the areas in black on this map just a few spots in the, in the Sahara. By 2070, places that with a mean annual temperature above 29 degrees will have expanded to fill all this area in brown hatching here. The whole of the top half of South America, most of North Africa, the Horn of Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, most of India, most of Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, New Guinea, and Northern Australia, these places will be uninhabitable by human beings 50 years from now. This, you know, the consequences of this for, for global uh, geopolitics are, are almost unimaginable. The consequences of it for the natural world, bearing what I, in mind what I said about safety nets and things, is, um, again, unimaginable. Um, so just to sum up, you know, climate change is the greatest threat to nature. All species and all ecosystems are, their very existence is threatened by climate change. But perhaps the second biggest threat to nature is how we react to climate change, the mitigation and adaptation strategies that we adopt. We need nature to avoid the worst of climate change. We also need nature to survive climate change, but there's a huge risk that the actions we take um, to, to survive climate change will worsen um, threats to nature and thereby undermine our, our prospects for survival in the long run. At the same time, um, climate actions also present huge opportunities for nature. I talked about tree planting as a threat for nature. Obviously, if tree planting is done well, it's a huge opportunity for nature too. So we really, really need to stop treating these two emergencies in isolation. We need synergistic policy like the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill to make sure that any synergies, you know, we can maximize the opportunities that are generated by treating these two emergencies simultaneously, and we can avoid any risks of treating them separately. So um, yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak. And, um,
yeah, delighted to take any questions if you have any. Well, no, it's brilliant. And to be honest, that that's inspired me as well. I think there's some bits that, you know, I knew and other bits that I didn't. So I'm hoping that everybody probably had the same journey as me. Um, and I can tell you, I know we've having beavers in Derbyshire coming soon. Uh, we're going to have two pairs. We're going to have um, four pairs potentially. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but I think one of the key uh, elements that's coming out of the Q&As is around kind of the social aspect so and I know that with all the the science and it's the key that we need in terms of evidence to pushing people to places so there's a lot around in terms of how we kind of promote that message to make people kind of kind of reconnect with ecology I think that's probably the best way to put it how they can actually feel the effects of it because of course it's quite a worldwide theme and how do we get that kind of political will so there's a lot of questions around um how do we um kind of talk to people on the social impact that it will have you know you mentioned about food chain things like that what do you think are on that aspect in terms of you know talking to people about that and kind of moving the 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 bill in terms of not only political kind of uh, you know public might not care but actually do they know about it how do we connect them together on that can I can I start with that yeah um there was um last year we reported this year was the climate assembly that was uh, set up by um uh some of the uh select committees in parliament for for select committee set up the climate assembly which was made use of deliberative democracy and they were asked to consider and deliberate about how the government should get to a 2050 target and they met over a period of time and they were drawn from they represented the united kingdom po population and they were really interesting when when they finished and you talk to those people who took part in the assembly and they basically said, I did not know. I did not know the extent of the crises that we were facing. I thought the government had this under control. I didn't know how bad it was. And I obviously, you know, we cannot force the government to um, start a, 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 a information um, or a media strategy around the dual crises that we face. But what local authorities can do and people can push for is to have local uh, people's assemblies or climate assemblies and actually start informing their local populations around what is happening. And, and some of the stuff is shocking, like 95% in many areas of our hedgehogs have gone. Your kids, my kids, have never seen a hedgehog never seen a hedgehog like you know what world are we living in where where those iconic british species no longer exist you know mm. it's and that that level of understanding amongst the population is shocking when when they come to it and hence they then accept the need for radical action to be taken yeah, no, th thanks, Sarah. I think that that probably tackles the two parts. It's also that, you know, it's not just the people don't care, it's that they don't know. And probably that part of they're not letting politicians know that actually they care. Um, so it kind of goes back to kind of the, the first question that you said, talking about it continually you know raising awareness and you know even your friend your colleague your family member can have much more of an effect but pushing your local authority as well to to, to talk as well as, as you mentioned and I think and the hedgehog it, fact is, is is one of those yes and yeah. and many local councillors and even many MPs do not understand the situation and do not have the answers to it because it you know they don't know what to do so to have the fallback of a citizens' assembly, of pulling in the experts, of not having to be in the in the position of having the answers, can be a, a, a way of uh, you know slicing through the Gordian's knot. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, I think um, we've sorry, got. Can I just yeah. very briefly add something to that question too? Um, one of the issues we've had, I think, um, in the past is that we've relied on scientists to communicate these issues. And scientists are very bad at communicating. We tend to think that facts and figures are sufficient to sway people. But actually, when you look at the psychological research, it's not our rational brains that are dominant in how we make decisions. It's our emotions. And, you know, 
we, yeah, so climate scientists have been trying to engage people using rational arguments and abstract ideas for four decades. And we've talked about 400 parts per million at 1.5 degrees, and we've been completely ignored. Along comes one 16 year old girl and starts speaking in emotive language rather than technical language. And then suddenly everyone's like, whoa, um, you, you know, people get it. Um, and I think this is what we need to do. We need to appeal to people's emotions, not their rational brains. And I think this is another um, way in which dealing with the nature um, and, and climate crisis synergistically is, is, is really important because climate change is a bit abstract and it is a bit something that uh, yeah, people can perceive this as something that's happening in the future or somewhere else. Whereas nature destruction is clear for everyone to see and it is something people care about. Over the pandemic, huge numbers of people are, you know, waking up to, to how important nature is for them. And I think appealing, you know, love is a hugely powerful emotion. People love the natural world and, and we need to appeal to that more rather than rational arguments a, a, a about why we need, you know, whatever. Yeah, no, thanks so much. And I think that does go to the heart of it, isn't it? It's how to get that head hot. Um, and also people dealing with their emotions around it as well. And that, that's a big part of the assemblies uh, and making sure that, that that gets there. So thanks so much on, on that, Charlie. I think there's probably one for you, Charlie, on here. Um, we've got from uh, one person looking to using um, HVO fuels in their fleet. Um, and they've said that they're from a sustainable, you know, how do they know it's from a sustainable source? Is there a quality stamp? I mean, that's quite a big, <laughs> with, with what you mentioned with Drax uh, as well. Sorry, I just don't have the specific expertise to be able to answer that question. Sorry. No, it's fine. Um, no, at least we've we've asked that. So um, I've also shared on YouTube. Somebody's asked about further information to send to their MPs, and I've shared the resource um, uh, link on there, uh, and I will send it out at the af afterwards as well. Um, uh, another one was with the government declaring that they're doing seventy eight percent reduction by twenty thirty five. How does that? Um, impact on the CE bill because of course it's come out with you know the aviation and shipping emissions which was one of the parts of the bill and um, what is that kind of your feeling on on that kind of uh, new target that the government set? Uh, yeah so um, <clears throat> I mean ev everything that moves it forward is good uh, the, the issues are around the government's targets like Charlie has highlighted is the use of bio is things like the use of biofuels, for example, which are considered carbon neutral, which is just you know just off the scale madness. Um, it relies it's going to rely on the use of nets as well, negative emission technologies to capture carbon from hydrocarbons when when it, it's burnt at source, and those technologies do not exist uh, as yet. Um, it doesn't include consumption emissions. So what we've done when we offshored our manufacturing, we offshored, uh, well, the pollution associated with that manufacturing, which includes the carbon emissions. So we're not counting for, for those consumption emissions. Um, so, so there are a number of issues associated with that 78% target. Um, and... <sighs> It's partly, I, I think there's partly also a issue around deliverability as, as well, but, that, but that's a much bigger issue, is that the government is currently on course to fail to meet its fourth and fifth carbon budgets as well. So it's all very well um, ramping up ambition, but it's about what the government is prepared to invest in. And the, uh, the current plan from the Committee on Climate Change looked at spending 1% 1% of GDP on addressing climate change. So it's, you know, and I think for some very different questions should be, should be being asked. And this is part, part of um, Andrew Sims and this idea of the rapid transition. It's like, what happens if we spend 10% of GDP on decarbonisation and uh, ecosystem restoration? What does that look like? Where does that get us to? What, when we went to war, 50%. I mean, it is an emergency. We are facing the loss of everything we cherish, our traditions, our heritage, our children's future, and we're prepared to spend 1% on addressing it. You know, it's so I think there are a number of problems associated with, with, with that target. 
consumption, deliverability and priority. And this is still not a priority for our government. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think that that kind of shows you, you know, in terms of emergency, isn't it? The word <laughs> um, and the difference on that. Um, I know I've got one other question, Charlie, uh, if you want to answer, absolutely fine. So just just to add that, um, you, you know, those targets are they are. Um, yeah, they're put out there as as targets, but without changing the um, legislative framework in all sectors that is necessary to meet those targets. So, you know, there's just this lack of joined up policy. You know, one branch of the government is saying we're going to decarbonize. The other branch of the gov government is saying we're going to have a 27 billion pound road building program. Um, and the whole thing about the climate and ecological emergency is that these, it's not a sectoral thing. It's not, oh, we'll let environment people do that. It underlies absolutely everything. So all policy at all in all sectors of government, at all levels of government, from local authority to, to, you know, international, this has to be integrated into absolutely everything, whereas it is still just piecemeal. And that's another example mm -hmm. of this not being a priority. It's a really yeah. good point. Yeah, and I think that that's a very valid point as well. And, and having a pathway that also links everything together, uh, then just a target as well. So, no, that's brilliant. I, I thought, Ian, you normally uh, add a, a juicy question if you've got one before the end. Um, I was just thinking about, I mean, I, I do say the same thing about, um, you know, technology, so pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, not existing yet. But I suppose it is, it's really important to contextualise just how um, massive the challenge of rolling those out is, but just how they just need loads more money being directed to them, don't they? And that's part of the government being serious about it. Because as you say, Charlie, we are on an overshooting pathway. Um, so there's no way that we're going to keep our emissions below. I mean, we're projected to, the Met Office today published a report saying that we're going to be going over 1.5 in the next five years, potentially. So, um, yeah, it's, I think it's important to remember that those technologies probably will become a massive part of how the global economy works. Um, but I was wondering how, how you guys feel about those and the messaging of saying they don't exist yet. Um, <laughs> they will, we, we do need them in the future. The problem is that they are used as an excuse to delay action now. Um, and this is just nonsensical. If your bath is overflowing, you don't invest in um, you know, starting to weave a new towel to mop up the excess flood water, you turn off the tap. And yeah, yeah, we will need towels in the future, but it's absolutely wrong for people to say, oh, no, it's OK to carry on um, leaving the tap on because we are weaving a towel. Um, you know, the do you have any thoughts on do you have any thoughts on how we would avoid that um, moral hazard? Because we are going to need those technologies, aren't we? But we're also going to need to cut our emissions. And that's always the justification for not using them. Well, I. I one of the pathways in, uh, on the Committee on Climate Change actually mapped out a pathway um, using uh, natural sequestration processes. And then they dismissed it as being unachievable because um, you, they, 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 wasn't in, they couldn't rely on it um, being adopted. I, I, I may be doing them a disservice on the actual uh, wording that they used, which struck me as complete madness because they are relying on technologies which exist theoretically but do not yet exist at scale to enable us to carry on burning fossil fuels. So it, it seems to me that yes we need, we absolutely need to sequestrate carbon because at 418 parts per million we're going back, what is it, three, ten million years? It's a world nobody has lived on before. Agriculture did not develop in in that world our cities were not planned and built for that world so yes we need sequestration but why not as charlie says stop the problem that we have now use the processes we have now and look at developing other technologies to come alongside it well, that's what we need to do we need to do everything but we need to stop making the problem worse as a starting point and if that means changing our societies then it strikes me we have no option because the alternative to carry on 
and hope that nets come over the hill like like the mythical unicorns is gambling with like five bullets in the revolver you know it's russian roulette with the chamber full it's you know it's the risk we are taking is so immense that why would you do that i finished now <laughs> i'd agree with everything you said <laughs> the risk Same is here. tremendous yeah um sorry i'll say nothing more heather um if you uh, if you want to, or just just quickly, actually, to say that there are some questions about resources, um, and we'll we'll gather those up from the Slido, um, and we'll put those on Slack. Um, and if anyone wants to carry on the conversation in any way, you know, please bring it to our, our workspace, um, and we'll be having more talkative sessions where people can you know voice their opinions and just chat about what's going on with climate and future. So look out for those as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there, Heather. No, yeah, and it is at the end of the time, and I don't want to keep Sarah or Charlie away from. Um, all, all their amazing work that they do as well. So I want to thank you both for your time. We really, really do appreciate it more than anything. And we can see your passion uh, and enthusiasm, which we, we also share. So we will uh, have this recording for people to rewatch afterwards and it will be open on YouTube on our uh, Collective for Climate Action channel. So anybody can watch it. So uh, we will share. Um, for anybody that is in a local authority or a civil service position, we do have um, a Slack channel in which Ian and I, um, we volunteer on. So if you do want to kind of connect and talk more about the uh, Climate and Ecological Bill um, and what we can do to talk to leadership about it, I am here, feel free to have a chat. And we've, as you said, you mentioned, De was it Devon Councils and a couple of others that have signed up. So um, yes, more than happy. So thank you guys for attending and I really appreciate your time and have a lovely lunch uh, and the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us. Thank you. Yes, thanks so thank much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.